Good evening, everyone. Uh, can I welcome you all uh, to tonight's uh, event? Uh, my name is Frank Dorn. I'm the um, chairman of the Speaker's Advisory Committee on Art, given its Sunday title. And um, we have a regular program of discussions around our parts of our collection, in, in, in this case tonight, um, and I'm delighted that um, as well as um, our main speaker, who I'll introduce in a second, we've got Lord uh, uh, and Lady Attlee, um, grandson of um, and granddaughter-in-law <laughs> of Clement Attlee here tonight, so, so we have that family connection, uh, which, is, uh, which is lovely, and I'm, I'm grateful for both of them for coming along. Uh, this talk, as I say, is part of, a, of an ongoing programme that we have, and uh, in particular, what we're looking at tonight is um, the statue of Clement Attlee by Ivor Robert Jones in the members' lobby uh, in the House of Commons. It's one of um, the many images we have. We have virtually all of the uh, an image in th 3D image, either a statue or a bust of virtually all of the 20th century Prime Ministers in the men members' lobby. And that's uh, been an important part of our work over the last uh, few years, um, to uh, have that uh, collection uh, improved and uh, hopefully fi uh, finalised at some not too distant date in the future. The, the Atlee statue was installed on 12th November 1979, almost exactly 35 years ago. Um, and um, it's one of only four full statues there. You've, you'll be aware of the others. Churchill, Attlee, Margaret Thatcher as the first woman um, uh, Prime Minister, and Lloyd George. Our speaker this evening is Dr Jonathan Black, a senior research fellow in the history of art at Kingston University. Dr Black has recently published a monograph, Abstraction and Reality, on the subject of this evening's talk, uh, the sculptor Ivor Robert Jones. I've got a copy of it. It's a very hefty tone. We're not allowed to sell copies here, but if you're interested in the subject, then um, I'm sure you will uh, buy a copy. Um, this uh, comes from the, re the research. The, 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 his connection with the, the, the Atlee statue, obviously, was part of his research. And as a, as a result of this, he and our deputy curator, Melanie Unwin, who's um, sitting at the front here, um, put together the proposal for us, first of all, a small display in, on the Atlee uh, statue, which you'll have seen immediately outside this room, just over here, um, for this talk to accompany the display, and the issuing of a facsimile edition of the booklet published when the statue was first unveiled, with a new foreword by Dr. Black, a copy of which should be on your chair. Okay, and in the new year, the launching of an audio tour of the statues um, uh, uh, in the vicinity of the Palace of West Westminster. Our thanks are owed to Kingston University and the Arts Humanities Research Council, not only for Dr. Black's involvement, but also for financially supporting uh, this group's activities. We'd also like to extend our thanks to the Government uh, Art Collection and Number 10 for loaning us the maquette of the statue's head, which is included in the display outside. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Black, who will tell us more about Ivor Robert Jones and how the statue of Attlee and others uh, came about, and there'll be an opportunity for questions after he's spoken. Okay, thank you, Mr. <coughs> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, a few thank yous from myself. I particularly wanted to thank uh, Melanie Unwin, who has been a pleasure to work with on this uh, project uh, to look at Ivor Roberts Jones and his work in and around the Palace of Westminster, but also on this quite exciting idea for a podcast which will uh, look at some of the sculpture uh, in, this, in the vicinity. And uh, little, uh, uh, the responses to that sculpture, or to the sculpture by uh, different uh, MPs, so I'm showing us my first image, our hero of the evening is Ivor Roberts Jones, uh, here about 1962. Uh, he was born, I'll give you a bit of biographical background, he was born in Oswestry in November 1913, the only child of William and Florence uh, Jones. William was a solicitor who hoped his son would one day become a high court judge. However, from an early age, as young as seven, young Ivor wanted to become an artist. And indeed, I would argue he became one of the finest 
British figurative sculptors for the public space of the 20th century and also one of this country's most talented ever portrait sculptors. Between 1923 and 1931 he studied at Oswald Street Grammar School and then went on to a minor public school then known as St Cuthbert's and now Worksop College in Nottinghamshire. In 1932 he moved to Goldsmiths College initially to study painting and graphic design but two years later, age 19, he decided he wanted to become a sculptor and in particular to work in clay, to model in clay. And he secured a place at the Royal Academy Schools and over the next uh, sort of three years he won annual prizes for modelling at the schools. In the late 1930s he joined the Territorials uh, in the form of the Royal Artillery and I think it's perhaps because of that or what this is one of the uh, reasons why one of his most revered examples of contemporary sculpture was Charles Sergeant Jagger's marvellous Royal Artillery Memorial on High Park Corner unveiled in October 1925. And Jagger, as we shall see, as I shall try to argue, cast a long and influential shadow over Ivor's sculpture. Meanwhile, at art school at the Royal Academy, he later recalled obsessively studying the sculpture of Auguste Rodin, Charles Despiau and Jacob Epstein. Within a year of the outbreak of the Second World War, he was a captain in a brigade of the Royal Field Artillery. And over 18 months in 1933-45, he saw action with the Royal Field Artillery in the, on the Arakan Peninsula and then in central and southern Burma. <clears throat> and during this period, he became a huge admirer of his overall commander-in-chief, the commander of the 14th Army, Field Marshal Sir William Slim, later the first of two figures of field marshals he would provide for Whitehall. After being demobbed from the army in December 1945, by the spring of 1946 he was working as a part-time tutor in modelling at Goldsmiths College, University of London, and he eventually was promoted to become head of sculpture in the department at the college uh, in 1964, and he would remain there in that post until he retired in July 1978. So into the 50s he exhibited at the Beaux-Arts Gallery in Bruton Street from 1954. Uh, in 1953 he was a founder member of the Society of Portrait Sculptors and then he held his first solo show at the Beaux-Arts Gallery in July 1957. One admirer of the portrait sculpture that he exhibited in that gallery was the grand old man of British painting, the rarely sober Augustus John. Three years after John's death in 1961, the painter's family commissioned Ivor to produce a life-size bronze figure of the painter to stand by the River Avon at Fording Bridge in Hampshire. Oh, I think. <coughs> See if I can lean over the, peer into the mouth of the, of the, of the, of the, so, there we go. So there he is working on, uh, he's polishing his, his Augustus John looking uh, Augustus Ivor, looking suitably haunted. Uh, this is for For Fording Bridge, which was unveiled in October 1967 by Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten. The figure that he produced of, of John was widely judged a success by luminaries within the art world, such as Sir Kenneth Clarke, Sir John Rothenstein, and the then president of the Royal Academy, Sir Charles Wheeler. <clears throat> and in part, with their support and lobbying, he was elected an associate of the Royal Academy in April 1969. So in March 1970, Ivor was one of the eight sculptors approached to participate in a competition for a statue in Parliament Square to Sir Winston Churchill. Nine initially were invited, eight including Ivor indicated that they would like to take part and the other sculptors were his friend Charles Wheeler, who was also Effie McWilliam, Oscar Nemon, Michael Rizzello, Fran Tobelski, Anthony Gray, and Bentley Clawton. The list had been drawn up by two expert advisers to the Statue Selection Subcommittee, and they were Sean Crampton, President of the Royal Society of British Sculptors, and Sir John Pope Hennessy, Director at the time of the V&A Museum. And the Selection Subcommittee uh, was composed of uh, two Sir Johns, Sir John Tilney and Sir John Rogers, Lord Shandos and George Strauss, who's the Labour MP for Vauxhall, 
and for many years the head of the uh, House of Commons Art Committee. Another, commit another member was Emmanuel Shinwell, who we would all come across in relation to the unveiling of the statue of, of Clement Attlee. Now, in July 1970, uh, the committee was impressed by Ivor's initial, uh, there we go, his initial uh, maquette of Sir Winston wearing garter robes. Uh, Winston had been made a Knight of the Garter in April 1953. But the committee thought that the figure should call to mind the Second World War, while the head needed much more work to become a more convincing likeness. A minority on the wider full committee for the statue also wanted to consider a figure idea submitted by Oscar Namon, who had already produced a very striking and powerful figure of Sir Winston for the members' lobby of the House of Commons, which was unveiled in December 1969. As asked by the subcommittee, Nemon and Ivor submitted a further maquette each early in November 1970, and by the middle of the month, Ivor's maquette had been approved by the subcommittee and the Royal Fine Art Commission. He was also asked to produce further studies of Churchill's head to make him look the age he had been during the war. The full Winston Churchill Statue Committee met in February 1971, and it became clear a group within it, led by Churchill's son-in-law, Duncan Sands, preferred Nemon's maquette and also Lady Spencer Churchill, the formidable Lady Clementine, let it be known that she thought that Neman had made the better likeness. So during January and February 1971, there was much plotting behind the scenes to, get, to give Neman a chance of securing the Parliament Square Commission. However, early in March 1971, the full committee decided to announce to the press that the, statue, that the Churchill Statue Commission had been awarded to Ivor, who produced a new maquette inspired by a photograph of a defiant, brooding Churchill inspecting the ruins of a bombed house, a chamber of the House of Commons early on the morning of 11th of May 1941. So Ivor's conception of his second figure, his second idea, his second stab at the maquette of Churchill, was, I think, in interesting enough, inspired or informed by an ancient Egyptian statuette in the British Museum of the, well, this is uh, his early sketch of the second version of the Churchill uh, statue. <coughs> and his conception of this second maquette uh, there you go, was related to, was it very much closely informed by an ancient Egyptian statuette in the British Museum of the hawk god Horus, made between 1550 and 1300 BC. He also liked, he was also thought, thinking of Rodin's celebrated figure of the writer Honoré Balzac that Rodin had made, circa 1896 to 1898. So just look at the sort of the silhouette of those two and the, how he conceived of, of uh, Churchill there as this sort of swaddled figure defined by the, the coat that he is wearing. But another figure that informed his eye conception of the second maquette was very close to home here, is Hamo Thornycross, marvellous figure of Oliver Cromwell from 1899 outside the House of Commons. And then across the channel, there's Francois Cognier's uh, somewhat later figure of an implacable, indomitable Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau, striding down the Champs Elysees, which was unveiled in 1932. For a while during the autumn of 1971, it's interesting that Ivor toyed with the idea of uh, the figure of Churchill, his second conception, surrounded by objects that would be illuminated at night to su suggest Churchill standing before the flames of a burning London during the Blitz of September 1940 to May 1941. This came to nothing as cost questions proved an insuperable object, and then at the same time, anything powered by electricity might well be affected by possible power cuts. I mean, this is the early 70s we're thinking about. So I'm first concentrated on getting Churchill's head and shoulders just right. And so we've got an image here of him working on a sort of full-sized head of Churchill uh, in his, uh, outside his barn at Coppings Farm, Cratfield, near Halesworth in Suffolk. Once that head was deemed correct, he made the rest of the figure in clay. And in October 1972, the Monument Committee approved the full-sized 
clay model. And then the artist then uh, cast the uh, clay into plaster between December 1972 and February 1973. He then sawed the plaster cast into over a dozen pieces in March 1973, and these were then dispatched to his favourite foundry, the Meridian Bronze Foundry on Concert Road, Beckham, where each section was cast separately between May and July 1973. During August and September 1973, Ivor supervised the reassembly of the work and the final filing of joints. And the final work, 3.6 metres high, was unveiled in Parliament Square in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen by Lady Clementine Spencer Churchill at noon on the 1st of November 1973. Uh, Sir John Tilney told the Times uh, the day after, or the, on the day of the unveiling, and I quote, Not every facet of such a historic character as Churchill can be captured in bronze. He, Churchill, lived so many lives, any one of which any of us would have been proud to have lived. But his grit and greatness are here for all to see. This heroic statue of the man who walked with destiny has arrived in its proper home in the heart of London, in the precincts of Westminster, where it will become an emblem and a spectacle for generations not yet born. Four days later, Ivor's friend Sir Charles Wheeler, until recently president of the Royal Academy, paid Ivor a handsome compliment in the letters pages at the time, stating that he had, and I quote, succeeded in creating a fine statue of a great man. At the time of its inception, I thought his task impossible of solution and said so. I now, I now must eat my words. As a character study, the sculpture is admirable. Its monumentality is very impressive, and it is altogether worthy of the historic plot it will occupy for many generations yet to come. The very next month, and this is in December 1973, Ivor was elected a full member of the Royal Academy on the f very first ballot, most unusual, with backing from nearly all the sculptors present at the election, including Charles Wheeler, Eduardo Paolozzi, Willie Sukup, and David McFall. Over the next year, few years, all four told him that they thought it had been impossible for one of their number to produce a statue of Churchill that would please so many within the public and the next year the Royal Society of British Sculptors awarded him a gold medal, and in 1975, Ivor was awarded at the CBE. Years later, in June 1993, Ivor told the Sunday Telegraph that the Parliament Square Churchill was, and I quote, the biggest sculpture to go up for God knows how long. As someone said, he makes all the others in Parliament Square look like stick men. I realised its shortcomings, but you have to admit you wouldn't confuse him with any other statue in the land. I was told, he was, I was told, the Rock of Gibraltar, and I gave them the bloody Rock of Gibraltar. But he sometimes could just as well look like a big petulant baby. I sometimes think I'd like to do him again, but then he used to caricature himself, and I'm afraid I did too. I could not help that, as I'd been told to make him into a sort of a symbol. History, you know, is full of people who will give you a brief, but I saw it the other day by accident and I suddenly thought, that was rather good. The following year he mentioned to the Eastern Daily Press how tenacious had been the opposition he had faced from Lady Clementine to his winning the Parliament Square Commission. To the very end he thought she might, and I quote, call in the heavy artillery to dispose of the statue. He added, and I quote, the best monuments mix dignity and caricature to give a kind of irony. They have an edge and suggest an inner life. My Churchill degree, to a degree, is a tetchy old man in a greatcoat, his jaw set against Hitler, old age and the elements, knuckles tensed as he grips a stick. I wanted, I wanted to suggest the war leader of 1940, as well as the bulldog at bay. And over the next three years, 1974 to 77, uh, I, he produced two further life-size bronze figures of Churchill, one for Solly Square in Oslo, unveiled in May 1976, and one outside the Hilton Hotel, New Orleans, in November 1977. It's obviously so well installed that it managed to survive Hurricane Katrina. In the mid-70s, he was commissioned to make a bronze head of Prince Philip for the Royal Society of General Practitioners, when the Prince was its honorary uh, president. 
1977, he was the only conventional figurative sculptor to sit on the selection committee of the Queen's Silver Jubilee Contemporary British Sculpture Exhibition held in Battersea Park. And then also in the late 70s, he received a commission to make a bronze portrait head of the Welsh politician Cledwyn Hughes, later at uh, the, the time a Labour MP for Anglesey, but not coincidentally a long-time member of the House of Commons Works of Art Committee. Now, to the Attlee Commission, which uh, comes in 1978, the competition for a 2.7 high uh, metre high bronze figure of Clement Attlee for the members' lobby of the House of Commons, I think possibly he was tipped off about the competition by Cleveland Hughes, who was on the memorial committee uh, for the statue when it first met in April 1977, as was George Strauss, the Labour MP for Oxhall, uh, Vauxhall, then the chair of the House of Commons Art Committee, as well as uh, Sir John Rogers, who you'll remember was uh, associated with the Churchill Commission. A subcommittee was formed to draw up a list of sculptors to be approached for the Attlee Commission. It was advised by Sir Hugh Casson, then president of the Royal Academy, and also Michael Rizzello, president of the Royal Society of British Sculptors. By late May 1977, a list of five sculptors had been drawn up. Ivor, Frantobelsky, James Butler, Robert Thomas and John Ragg. All agreed to participate and have submitted maquettes in plaster to the committee by mid-October 1977. The subcommittee was most impressed by those produced by Thomas and also by Ivor, which depicted Attlee wearing his garter robes. Unfortunately, this seems to have been broken up and I can't show you an image of it. Now, Attlee had been a made, made a knight of the garter in April 1956, and I think Ivor was a huge fan of uh, Clem, uh, Clement Attlee, who he referred to, I think, only slightly in jest as Iron Clem, uh, may have been aware of his characteristic reaction to the honour uh, to the honour of being made a knight of the garter, penning this memorable clary hue, and I quote, Few thought he was even a starter. There were many who thought themselves smarter, but he ended BM, CH and OM an earl and a knight of the garter. <laughs> so there was a lot more to Clem than you'd think. He was able to sort of pen that quite quickly on hearing that he'd been awarded this, uh, he'd been uh, made a knight of the garter. Now the subcommittee asked Thomas and uh, Ivor to resubmit wor reworked maquettes and Ivor was specifically asked to depict Clem wearing a business suit and to make the head larger and its features more distinct. Both sculptors were given a further three months and the revised maquettes were submitted at the end of January 1978. On his own initiative, Ivor also submitted a small plaster bust of Attlee's head. And I'm showing you here an image of, of, of this uh, plaster head of Attlee. Uh, the, uh, it's probably the painted head now in the government art collection until recently on display at number 10 Downing Street from whom we had an inordinate effort to wrest it from them for this display. Now, the subcommittee unanimously selected Ivan for the commission and, uh, and he was formally asked to accept it in April 1978. Doing so, he was asked to work on the legs of his Attlee figure so that the, the final figure would not be dwarfed by Nemon's figure of Churchill facing him across the members' lobby. Now, Ivan admired, admired Attlee uh, for his impressive First World War record Attlee had risen to the rank of major during the war, starting off as a second lieutenant in the reserves, and as a man of principle and determination. Beneath Attlee's quiet diffidence and modesty was an iron core, an iron core of self-belief and granite hard purpose, which Ivor admired tremendously. So I he conceived an informal image of Attlee as the man that his family knew could tell very funny, dryly witty anecdotes. And the sculptor liked the fact that Attlee was a voracious reader of detective fiction, as was Ivor, especially Agatha Christie, and surprisingly Raymond Chandler. Interesting to think of Ivor, uh, uh, Attlee being a fan of uh, Sam Spade and the era of detective, the gumshoe. Ivor depicts him reaching into his left hand, uh, uh, Attlee reaching into his left hand pocket for his pipe tobacco and possibly one of his two pipes that he always carried on him, as well as a two ounce tin of his favorite gold bar tobacco. And the statue posed, owes a certain uh, debt to Rodin's expressively pointing John the Baptist from 1878 to 1880. 
Uh, the later sculptor Ian Walters later told me that he'd looked at Ivor's conception of Attlee to and I quote, animate his statue that he had created of Harold Wilson, the Huddersfield Railway Station, which was unveiled in July 1999. It's interesting to know that Ivor had seen Attlee on the general election stump in October 1951, and then again in May 1955, and was very much struck upon the latter occasion by how much Attlee seemed to have aged. Attlee indeed had been ill and was troubled by a duodenal ulcer and by recurring problems caused by his two old war wounds from the First World War. Uh, Attlee had been hit by shell fragments in Mesopotamia in 1916 and then again while serving in northern France in the summer of 1918. You all, I also mentioned how, he, how much impressed he had been by how Prime Minister James Callaghan had described Attlee in December 1976 when proposing the statue be erected in the members' lobby. Uh, Callaghan referred to Attlee as, and I quote, the man who wound up the empire and established the welfare state, a life dedicated to advancing the welfare of the British people and to breaking down the notion of the two nations. He made no song and dance about identifying with working people. He had no need to. He had a natural affinity with them. What he did was rooted in his humanity, his practicality and his patriotism. As a parliamentarian, he brought to the House of Commons the same decency, honesty and integrity as he showed in his private, everyday behaviour. I suppose to use a contemporary term, Attlee could speak human. Now the 9 foot or 2.74 metre high bronze statue of Attlee was unveiled on the 12th of November 1979 by the 95 year old Lord Emmanuel Shinwell the oldest member of, of either house at the time, and Shinwell had entered the House of Commons the same year as Attlee in 1922. He was always much further to the left within the Labour Party than Clem during the 1930s. Clem had distrusted Emmanuel's, uh, Shinwell's adoration of Stalin, as well as his enthusiasm for Zionism. However, in 1945, Attlee made Shinwell his Minister for Fuel and Power. Three years later, he moved Shinwell from the post in the wake of the severe coal shortages during the bitter winter of 1947 to become a surprisingly successful Secretary of State for War and Minister of Defence. Now, Shinwell was introduced, interestingly enough, uh, prior to the unveiling by Mr Speaker George Thomas, uh, at the time uh, Labour MP for Cardiff Central and then also Secretary of State, uh, or had been Secretary of State for Wales, and he was Speaker from 1976 to 1983. It's interesting that within about two years, he'd sat to uh, Ivor for a, a head here, a very striking head, uh, which is just up the road in the National Portrait Gallery, or there's a, ca a cast of it. Another cast by Ivor of George Thomas uh, was, commi was commissioned by the Welsh Portrait Sculpture Trust and is now in the collection of the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. Now, it seems that Ivor actually got on a house on, like a house on fire with Thomas and his razor-sharp bit. He thought the speaker had, and I quote, the head worthy of a pharaoh, a pharaoh such as Achnaton. Also present at the unveiling ceremony, along here you can see there's an interesting quartet of, of uh, past and the current Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, was the former Prime Minister, James Callaghan, whose description of Attlee had so impressed from 1976 had so impressed uh, uh, Ivor. And he would sit to Ivor for a portrait bust over 1986 to 1987, while uh, he had been a Labour MP for Cardiff South up until 1987, when Callaghan was ennobled and sent to the Lords. And the head of him was commissioned by the Welsh Portrait Sculpture Trust and was presented to the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff in November 1989. I think it's a rather sort of lively, so a rather unfortunate pattern, but I think it's an extremely lively and engaging head of, I think, one of our underrated Prime Ministers, uh, Lord Callaghan. Now, another prominent guest on the unveiling of the statue of Attlee, as you can see here looking up, uh, was Prime, the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher who it is clear from his correspondence in the early 1980s, Ivor rather admired. 
because she stuck to her principles, however unfashionable and however outnumbered. But Ivor later in life deplored her promotion of unfettered materialism. She had represented the Conservative Party on the Attlee Memorial Committee, and during uh, the sort of early 1990s, Ivor spoke several times of wanting to do her portrait for the Carlton Club or, and or for Parliament. To the Eastern Daily Press, for example, in January 1994, he also mentioned the same article that he would like to do a statue one day of the then Prime Minister John Major for the members' lobby of the House of Commons. And interestingly enough, in November 1999, as Baroness Thatcher, she would unveil Ivor's Bond statue of Winston Churchill in Winston Churchill Square in the third district of Prague. Now, as it happened, as sittings were just starting on his head of Callaghan in 1987, Ivor was approached by the Burma Star Association in June of that year to take part in a competition to make an over-life-sized figure of the war hero, Field Marshal Sir William Uncle Bill Slim of Burma for Whitehall. Also taking part in the competition were James Butler, Michael Rizzello, Christopher Marvel and David Norris. Ivor had been recommended to the Burma Star Committee by a combination of the Royal Fine Arts Commission and three of the committee's five expert advisers, including Sir Hugh Casson, the painter Roger de Grey, who was about to become president of the Royal Academy, and Sir David Piper, uh, then director of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Participants were advised to conceive of a figure of Slim wearing his jungle uniform as commander of 14th Army, 14th Army in Burma between 1943 and 1945. And it's clear that Ivor was inspired by a photograph he, he bought from the Imperial War Museum here of a vigilant looking Slim taken in March 1945 outside his forward tactical headquarters on the road to the key central Burmese town of Mektila as Slim's forces closed in on the Japanese in the process of their being decisively routed, one of the worst defeats the Japanese army ever suffered in the entire Second World War. And I think it's, it's lovely to see here this photograph that was found after Ivor's death in his studio. You can still see the sort of plaster thumbprint of the artist, so indicating here that he'd definitely been using this photograph. Now, Ivor approved of the display of, Slim, of the display of Slim's brawny forearms, and you can see that uh, when he conceived the figure of Slim showing off those forearms, he was very much thinking also of one of his favourite works by one of his favourite sculptors, and this is the figure of the shell carrier by Charles Sergeant Jagger for the Royal Artillery Memorial on Hyde Park Corner. And the pose that he, uh, that he adopted for the figure accentuates Uncle Bill's formidable bulldog jaw, a jawline, uh, Ivor said, with all the power of the ocean liner RMS Queen Mary. Now, the Burma Star Committee meeting in May 1988 review, reviewed the five maquettes submitted and unanimously chose Ivor's for the commission. Expert assessors Sir Hugh Casson and Sir David Piper were impressed as were Slim's widow and family. Ivor was, was, as his usual habit, focused on getting the head just right and at the same time tinkered endlessly with the pose of the figure. How far back should the head and the body tilt? How much of the face would be left in the shade by the brim of Slim's bush hat? Should he be de depicted with a carbine slung over his shoulder, which he indeed usually carried when in the field? Part of the brim of the hat in the end was removed to reveal more of Ivor's magnificent head of Slim, who apart from looking the part, was a thinker, a talented writer who had supp supplemented his army pay in the 1930s by writing murder mysteries and short stories, and would later write a best-selling volume about the Burma campaign, Defeat into Victory, published in 1956, as well as a best-selling memoir entitled Unofficial History, published in 1959. Ivor's studio assistants noticed that he put even more of himself than usual into the Slim Commission. Everything had to look just right for his whole wartime chief. It also greatly counted in Slim's favour from Ivor's perspective that Slim had been pers personally selected in January 1949 by Clement Attlee to be his chief of the Imperial General Staff. In doing this, Clem blithely ignored uh, Field Marshal Montgomery's then Chief of Staff's recommendation of a successor. 
interesting to note that witnesses had never seen the usually ebullient Monty so chastened after it had a 20-minute meeting with the PM as departing CIGS. Latley, apparently with his uh, talent for the succinct dismissal, was one of the few men to have ever humbled Monty. Now, the statue of Slim was unveiled to great acclaim in April uh, 1990, and one in, a particular admirer was the fellow veteran of the Burma campaign, George MacDonald Fraser, then writing his memoir of the Second World War, quartered safe out, eh, safe out Here, which was first published in 1993. George MacDonald Fraser later mentioned in a newspaper interview that when trying to remember Slim, he could not help but think of the statue, its jawline and the distinct impression it radiated that the man depicted above all knew what he was doing and had the resolution to see his plan through to a successful conclusion. As so often in the past, one successfully re realised commission led smartly to another, and again this would be for Whitehall. In the audience for the unveiling of the Sim statue had been the former Chief of the Defence Staff, Field Marshal Lord Carver. He thought Ivor had done a superb job for the Burma Star Association and suggested to the Master Gunner of St James's, General Sir Martin Farndale, that the Royal Regiment of Artillery commission Ivor to make a statue for Whitehall of the ex-gunner and World War II Master of Strategy, Field Marshal Allenbrook, informally known while CIGS and then as General Sir Francis Allen, uh, Sir Alan Francis Brook as Old Shrapnel. Ivor was formally given the commission for a three metre high figure in bronze of Old Shrapnel in May 1991. He quickly set to work. Oh, there is Old Shrapnel, looking unusually benign, like taken by Karsh. It's a rather nice uh, coincidence. There's a lovely photograph of Atley just outside here by Karsh, taken at the same time, October 1943, during the Ottawa Conference. So he first set about uh, working on a maquette of the head as well as experimenting with the pose of the overall figure. Now, in the face of, of Atley, he sought to suggest what he called the subject's double edge, the toughness and the sensitivity that had been central to Alan Brooks' personality. The man who had impressed Stalin at Tehran in 1943 for his no-nonsense bluntness who repeatedly stood up to Churchill and talked him out of many of his more far-fetched military ideas, but who was also a keen fisherman, naturalist, bird-watcher, cartoonist and amateur photographer, who struggled to repress his high-strung anxieties and camouflage his occasional bouts of crippling self-doubt. As Ivor wrote in an article for the Royal Academy in the late 1980s, the best portraiture combined, in his, uh, in his opinion, a delicate, unstable balance of malice and love, with a degree of caricature in the realisation of a subject's features bordering on unabashed caricature. There is an element of this, I would argue, in Alan Brooke's portrait, but the result is a success and overwhelmingly compelling in the presentation to the viewer of what the subject referred to in his diaries in May 1944 as, and I quote, the crushing mask of command, of pretending that you are absolutely confident of success when you are really torn to shreds with doubts and misgivings. Once decisions are taken, the time for doubts are gone and what is required is to breathe the confidence of success into all those around. It would appear that Ivor had long been prepared to think well of Alan Brooke after reading in the early 1960s the Field Marshal's Diaries, a controversial publication even in their abridged form in 1957. To Ivor, the stance of the subject had to, uh, well, for first he'd matched her. Once he'd decided on the head, he matched that to the, the body. And the stance or the pose for his uh, figure is derived actually from a quite a surprising source. And this is a sculpture by a, a probably the sort of Norwegian equivalent of Rodan, who was called Gustav Wiesland. This was a statue that Ivor had seen in Oslo in 1976, uh, while he was visiting Oslo for the unveiling of his statue of Churchill in May of that year. I think it's very brave to have Alan Brooks' trunk, uh, I think, facing the viewer with his head angled uh, in, uh, upwards in profile to our left. And he'd also studied closely a, a, stat, a photograph of Alan Brooke taken in October 1941 during exercises on Salisbury Plain when Alan Brooke was Commander-in-Chief of the Home Forces. 
the general was invariably immaculately turned out in the manner of a First World War senior officer. But I was also struck by the facial expression in this photograph. Alan Brooke was absolutely furious as moments before he'd come across a line of Britain's latest main battle tanks immobile in the mud as a consequence of engine failure and poor design. He dearly wanted to tear a strip off somebody, certainly the armoured division's commander, but was aware of the presence of an official photographer at whom he directs a steely half-smile. Now, the full-size plaster uh, model of the statue was completed in May 1992. Ivor kept tinkering with it, as was his usual habit, and it did not go to the Meridian Foundry to be cast until October that year and the figure was finally unveiled by Her Majesty the Queen in May 1993. Its reception, if anything, was even more fulsome than had been accorded to the figure of Slim three years earlier on Whitehall. Field Marshal Carver wrote to the sculptor, and I quote, Yesterday was a great day for you and all of us who have been involved in the Allen Book statue. It was wonderful to see your splendid statue there, where everyone can see it so well, with Allen Book defiantly looking towards Hague, this is the statue of Hague, on horseback by Alfred Hardiman, as if saying, I showed you how to conduct war in a better way. Sir Martin Farndale, in his capacity as Master Gunner of St James, promptly wrote to congratulate the sculptor, and I quote, on behalf of all ranks of the Royal Regiment of Artillery, to thank for you for your masterly statue of Allenbrook. I thought that he looked magnificent as Her Majesty the Queen unveiled it yesterday. Allenbrook was such a strong and intelligent man, and this you have captured to perfection, along with his characteristic stance. It takes a proud place in the centre of the capital. Your work is such a vital part of our national history, and it is wonderful, too, that you are a member of our regiment. Now, journalist Byron Rogers was to hail Ivor in June 1993 in the Sunday Telegraph, and as I quote, the last of the great icon makers, which in a part uh, suggested the name of this talk, and argued that as a veteran of the Second World War, Ivor had the particular knowledge to suitably commemorate his contemporaries in sculpture. This was where Ivor mentioned Alan Brooke possessing, and I quote, that enticing double edge, a mixture of weakness and strength. Ivor was now by, was by, was by now aged 80 years, but thought he had a few good years left in him. He was to die in harness in his studio at the Bridles Shrimpling in Norfolk, aged 86, on the 9th of December 1996, from a heart attack while working on the full-size plaster maquette of a, national, of a memorial to the police, the National Police Memorial, that was destined for the mall, but a new team of architects and artists was brought in after his death. And the statue that Ivor created finally ended up in the gardens at Renishaw Hall in Derbyshire. In one of his last interviews to the Eastern Daily Press in January 1994, Ivor spoke of how proud he was in a world where so little seemed to last, that at least he had created some statues of enduring worth to commemorate true heroes, in an age when such heroes were in sadly short supply. He was particularly pleased not only to have Winston in Parliament Square, Iron Clem in the House of Commons lobby, but also Slim and Allen Book in such a magnificent setting on Whitehall. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jonathan. That's a tour de force, not just around uh, Latley, but the, many of the statues that we see about us in the, uh, in the precincts and just outside the precincts of uh, the House of Commons.